Welcome to Scoop and Scale, where we dish up the science and weigh facts about mostly equine nutrition. I'm Michelle Anderson. I spent two decades working in equine media, and I currently create content and help veterinarians and businesses connect with horse owners through my consulting business, Cadence Marketing and Media. I'm a trail rider, dressage rider, and an at-home horse keeper. And I'm equine nutrition consultant, Dr. Claire Tunis of Clarity Equine Nutrition. I develop diet plans for horses, ranging from metabolic seniors to Olympic athletes. I also consult for equine nutrition companies. I'm a scientist, dressage rider, and a pony club mom. Claire and I collaborated for years when I was the editor of an equine publication, and she was one of our regular contributors. We'd finish work, but we always had more to talk about. New products, new research, and our own horses. This podcast is an extension of those conversations. It's for anyone who wants to make better choices when it comes to feeding and caring for their own horses. And before we get started, a quick disclaimer. The information in this podcast is general and not meant to replace the individualized advice of your own qualified equine nutritionist or veterinarian. While I have a PhD in nutrition, I'm not a veterinarian and can't give medical advice. With that, thank you for joining us and we hope you enjoy the following episode. So today we're talking about pituitary pars intermediate dysfunction or PPID. You might have also heard it called equine Cushing's disease. It's most commonly identified in horses during their teen years and beyond, although onset can be earlier than we horse owners might recognize. Uh, The published ranges vary, but most researchers believe that between 20 and 30 percent of horses will develop the disease. But our guest today knows much better than I do. We're excited to have Dr. Laura Jefsikis, who's a board-certified internal medicine specialist at Rhinebeck Equine in New York with us. Thanks for being our first guest. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Laura and I work together quite a bit, and I'm excited to introduce her to Claire. They haven't met before or worked together, so Claire, Laura, Laura, Claire. Laura, it's super nice to have you on. Thanks for joining us. I'm excited to pick your brain. (laughs) Very Um, (laughs) Virtually. <laughs> so one of the things that Claire and I wanted to do when we had the idea of having a podcast is to bring people in to have discussions about horse care. And we've invited Laura uh, in particular because she's really nice and I like her, um, but also because Claire and I really like talking to smart horse women. So there's that. Uh, but Also, PPID is really complicated. It's something that Claire deals with uh, as a nutritionist. It's something I deal with as a horse owner. I have a gelding who was diagnosed a couple of years ago. And I understand how overwhelming it can be to manage this disease for a horse owner. Having a veterinarian as a partner in your care decisions is critical. And so we thought it was critical to have a veterinarian here to be part of this conversation as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's really these horses managing them as a team approach is so so important um but laura you have like a lot of letters after your name (laughs) and uh more more than more than claire does even (laughs) (laughs) so uh no i don't have another mv i promise um (laughs) but um i think it's you know useful to our listeners to explain right there is a doctor of veterinary medicine the dvm they're used to seeing and then you are also a acvim um yeah. what does that stand for so acvim is the american college of veterinary internal medicine and i'm a dacvim which is a diplomat of the american college of veterinary internal medicine it's quite a mouthful uh, and really what that means is that following my four years of veterinary school, I went on and had additional advanced training and sought board certification in this case in internal medicine. So to be a diplomat, uh, you have to complete an internship after vet school and then either two or more often with what I did a three year residency program, almost always at a university in internal medicine. And during that time, you get advanced training in disease processes, uh, advanced diagnostic techniques, imaging, and treatment. 
And then we get to take a series of really fun exams uh, <laughs> and publish papers. And there's a whole list of criteria that we have to right. fulfill to be considered. And it's not just equine, right? You do them in your right. exams. They're right. everything. Exactly. So I'm a, I'm a large animal internal medicine specialist. So I did have to take my exams on uh, horses, but also cows, sheep, goats, camelids as well. My residency cool. program, uh, we did not see many things other than horses, but the occasional other large animal species as well. So makes, for this, this makes the exam all fun. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, uh, for, but now, now that I'm in private practice, I truly only work on horses and have only done that for the past 15 years or so. But if a llama walked in the door, <laughs> I would run away. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so, so they're okay. Just, I like just, just? Okay. Yeah. So to, to clarify what I'm, so I think powerful people might have heard you referred to as like an internist and yeah. to clarify internists sort of specialize in the systems of the horse and how those systems function. Is that a kind of correct sort of? Yes. Yeah, so right. The way I sometimes explain it is we encompass many specialties in human medicine. So I do cardiology, neurology, gastroenterology, pulmonology, uh, immunology, infectious disease, really anything that can make endocrinology. Uh, anything which, which we're going to talk about yeah. today. <laughs> can, can make a horse sick. Right. Yeah. So that's why you are sort of a specialist who would find yourself kind of helping people manage these horses with exactly. PID. Okay. okay. Yeah, that's that's cool to understand. So I I help with some chronic long-term conditions like PPID. And then I also help a lot of acutely very, very ill horses. So there's a pretty broad range within internal medicine, but it is much more specialized than what your general practitioners would do. Uh, and probably the other specialty that people are most familiar with is surgeons, and I do no surgery at all. Uh, I work with surgeons um, as a team, but we complement each other. So. Um, so for PPID, I, I mentioned that people know it as equine Cushing's disease, but the name did change, and there, were, there has been a big push to name it correctly. Why did the name change, and what does that have to do with the disease itself and how it presents on the horses? Yeah, it's a good question. So Cushing's disease, the name came from a disorder in humans. Uh, and and there are also Cushing's disease in dogs as well. But while they are all related to the pituitary gland, it's different parts of the pituitary gland that are affected. So the PPID refers to pars pituitary intermedia disorder. And the, so it is the intermediate lobe of the pituitary gland that has the problem. Uh, and that's different from other species. And the effects of the disease are different compared to other species as well. So it helps differentiate the different bee processes. So, so what exactly is going on in a horse that has PPID, like with their pituitary? Yeah, so they have an overactive portion of their pituitary gland. And what ends up happening is they over secrete a number of hormones, uh, compounds that have many different activities throughout the body. And ACTH, which we'll talk about later, is one of those compounds. And the end result is that there are higher levels of cortisol in the body. But one thing I think that people really don't understand is that ACTH is only one of many compounds with the pituitary gland secretes in excess in horses with this disease. It's the one that we are most capable and familiar with measuring, but there are a number of others that still have physiologic effects. So it's our marker for the disease, but it's not the only the only hormone that matters. Okay. And so, you know, I run into, as I said, I, I mean, I, I run to a lot of horses with PPID doing what I do. It's people, once they've been diagnosed, their owners are often motivated to, you know, seek nutrition help. Definitely. Um, I also work with a number of senior horses where I'm listening to the owners and I'm like, mm, this is sounding, I'm hearing 
conversations about symptoms that make me think, oh, maybe there's something going on here. Yeah. Um, you know, and so many people just associate PPID with, oh, the horse doesn't shed and it's, you know, got a shaggy coat, da 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 da. And because um, hypertrichosis is such a common sort of clinical sign of the disease, people really hang their hat on that. And I hear a lot of like, but he sheds out fine. Um, you know, so what are some of the other s- symptoms that, you know, veterinarians and, you know, that, you know, would be looking for the owners might not realize that they're missing? Yeah. It's a great question because when they get to the point of having hypertrichosis, they're already in the advanced stages of the disease. So it's really important if we can try to recognize the importance earlier on in the disease process. And there is a whole slew of things that can be pretty subtle that may want to test that horse. It can just be as simple as a change in attitude. They're more lethargic than they usually are. Um, decrease performance. When it comes to the hair coat, they may not have the long shaggy hair coat yet, but they may have what we call zinginal hypertrichosis, where there are just certain areas that shed out more slowly than they used to, or uh, long, what we call long guard hairs, often over the elbows and the flanks of the horse. So they'll sometimes shed out relatively normally, but retain some individual long hairs, and that can be an early sign. Uh, we also see regional, what we call regional adiposity, which means that there are fat deposits, particularly along the tail head and in the crest of the neck. So their whole body pipe can start to change subtly. And it is often very subtle to start with. Then there are also, now we know there are a bunch of musculoskeletal effects as well. They can have desmitis, dispensary desmitis, specifically tendonitis. Um, of course, we worry a lot about laminitis, which I'm sure we'll talk about more later, but uh, any of those signs also might be a sign that your horse needs to be tested. And then in our brood mares, if they suddenly start becoming less fertile, a heart harder to get them in full, then they need to, um, that can be an early sign as well. So with my gelding, I bred and raised him, so I know him really well. Yeah. And he started being just a little cranky and not his playful fun self and then I noticed he was drinking more at night you know his buckets were a little lower and then he was peeing quite a bit more and that was something he was always kind of shy you know it wasn't something and I'm like I'm seeing him do that too much or more than I I have in the past are those typical as well yeah very typical typically we don't see the polyuria increased urination and polydipsia increased drinking until later stages of the disease, but that's a really important thing for a number of disease processes, kidney, kidney disease in particular, to be aware of what is normal for your horse. And any change over time, decrease or increase, is worth investigating. Yeah, we had a horse in our barn this summer. I live in Arizona and it's like been super stupid hot here. Um, And we had a horse, I think he's about 19, struggling to sweat this summer. And um, I actually encouraged his owner to reach out to the vet. They just pulled blood last week um, to see if he's in the early stages of PPID because we, he also got scoped for ulcers earlier this summer. And despite you know, he drank a ton of water, so the scoping didn't actually work because he was so full of water. So it's like, hang on a minute. We have a horse that, you know, right. when you put him on bucket water, is drinking a ton of water. He's not sweating great. You know, and I shared with her, I was like, you know, this might be nothing. I might be barking out completely, but you need to talk to your vet because, you know, these are early symptoms of, you know, and his age. Yeah. It's also a reason while the automatic waters are really convenient, it makes it harder to monitor their water intake. Yeah. So I have three automatic waters that I paid for that are sitting waiting to be installed. And I kind of kind of made me take a pause. I'm like, I don't think I would have noticed the drinking thing. Yeah. You know, you're in a stall and you can at least monitor, have an idea of how much they're urinating. You can probably still tell, but it's certainly not as objective. Uh, We we religiously monitor water intake in our hospitalized patients all the time. Yeah. And I think there's a real, when you start talking, I mean, my horse I had in high school you know, he used to react to spring allergies. He reacted to vaccines. He, you know, had a cough in the spring, was lethargic, he shed out beautifully in the spring, but got his winter coat a little on the earlier side. And, yeah, you know, this was for probably, I want to say seven or eight years. And we thought of all these things as discrete 
things that were just him. And then, you know, we're talking back in the early 1990s. We weren't even really that, didn't know much about Cushing's at PPID back then. Um, and then I went to grad school and I remember phoning my mom and saying, I think you need to get him tested for, you know, what we were calling Cushing's at the time. I mean, they live in the rural England in an area where people were like, what? Yeah, <laughs> no, it was really new. And sure enough, he tested positive. And suddenly we looked back on all these things he'd had over the last decade and went, oh, I mean, he was in his Yeah, and that's really that common. Point. Yeah, I, you know, I, I didn't talk about it before, but the other thing is just recurrent infections, uh, rain rot, foot abscesses, uh, corneal ulcers that are slow to heal, uh, anything like that, where the horse is just not quite responding as they should, um, can be an early sign. Yeah, so, you know, hopefully uh, people aren't too panicking now. They've heard all these list of things that, you know, <laughs> that could be, and it could be something else, is why, which is why it's so important to get your vet involved, right? Because yeah. these are also symptoms Absolutely. of other conditions. So you, you do just have to get your vet out. But let's say, you know, somebody gets their vet out and and they're going to test. We've talked a little bit about the fact you can test for Cushing's. What does that look like? What tests are they going to do? You mentioned earlier uh, a hormone. Like, what are they going to be looking for? Yeah, so we are almost always doing a blood test to measure ACTH, which is one of those hormones that's secreted in excess by the pituitary gland if the horse has PPID. Uh, What when we measure that and if we need to do a stimulation test depends a bit on the horse's sign as well as the time of year. And this is where things get really fun because it's really confusing. They're really confusing. So yeah, I've changed <laughs> and it keeps changing. Yes. So uh, we often will do a, a baseline ACTH sample, which means you just go out and draw the blood uh, and just send it off to the lab. We, the sample also has to be handled very carefully. We have to separate the, the blood relatively quickly. So there's there's all kinds of ways we can uh, affect the results. But a baseline ACTH um, can be diagnostic depending on the time of year and how high that number is. So it is actually most sensitive in the fall. And if that, because we know that ACTH has a seasonal rise in the fall, and because it's something that helps the work body prepare for winter. Uh, and so if you bring the ACTH is above the normal seasonal rise in the fall, then that can be diagnostic of pushing. There are gray zones, though, with all of our test results. So it's really important that we take the whole history and clinical signs into account when we're trying to interpret those results uh, and try to decide if that, especially when we get a gray zone result, if that is truly diagnostic or if we may need to retest that once at a later date. The more sensitive test that we are using more and more now is called a TRH stim test. And that is thyrotrophin releasing hormone of the TRH and that stimulates the release of ACTH. Uh, so instead of just measuring how much ACTH is in the horse's body um, without stimulating the pituitary to do anything, this test stimulates release of ACTH. And what happens is that in, in a normal horse, we still you get a rise of ACTH, but in a horse with PPIZ, that rise is very dramatic. And so that is now the recommended test for horses with anything on that list of early clinical finds that we talked about. If they have hirsutism, hirsutism is actually more diagnostic than any laboratory test. I still recommend testing them so that we know what their level is, which is important in monitoring response to treatment. But you already have your diagnosis if the horse has hirsutism. Um, but short of that, I, testing is is warranted. And so depending on the veterinarian's preference and again time of year they may choose to do a baseline APH first if they get a diagnosis great if they feel that they may go back and do a, a TRH stim test so we as horse owners will think something maybe isn't right some of us panic and say I need to talk to my vet right now others go well 
uh, we're going in for vaccines in the spring or we're or we have to do boosters in the fall or is there a, t- a point where you would like horse owners to bring their horses to you if they are suspicious at all that that they could have PPID? Um, I think if they're having clinical signs that are concerning affecting the horses quality of life or requiring you know veterinary attention then I think it's it's warranted uh, because the earlier we can treat them then the more we can prevent those additional side effects and the disease it's not you know it's not a curable disease we manage it we don't cure it so yeah. it is a lifelong diagnosis but that's also a reason why it's really important to have a as definitive a diagnosis as we possibly can and you know one thing I see a lot is particularly if it happens to me in time of year when it's harder to interpret our test results if people are concerned particularly because the horse has signs of laminitis they may opt to just start the horse on treatment with or without having test results and then once they're on treatment it becomes it's impossible to go back and get an accurate diagnosis so I actually now if I feel like the initial diagnosis may not be right um, and the horse is stable clinically, not having active laminitis in particular, sometimes I will pull them off the of medication and retest them a month later um, just to really have an idea of if that's truly the diagnosis for that horse. Yeah, and so I, I feel like I would like the nutritionist hat on plug that if people have their horses tested for PPID, I love to see them also run a metabolic panel. Yeah, absolutely. To also see if the horse is insulin resistant, because from my perspective, trying to do diets, that's actually a really important piece of the puzzle for me yeah. is, okay, is it PPID and is it also insulin dysregulated? Because if it is... I have my hands a lot more tied with what I can suggest feeding that horse than if it is an insulin dysregulated. And, you know, we're talking a lot about laminitis. You know, could you maybe speak a little bit about the relationship between those two, the fact that they don't always go together and how that kind of helps? Yeah, absolutely. So I always think of it as a, a, uh, you know, there's there's an overlap. So they can have PPID without equine metabolic syndrome, they can have equine metabolic syndrome without PBID, and then they can have both together. And a horse that has PBID is more likely to also have hyperinsulinemia, equine metabolic syndrome, um, than a horse without PBID. So I agree 100%. And in our practice, we almost are always measuring an ACH and insulin together um, and send them out quite frequently of the you know, is a dual test to try to get a better idea of what's happening with that horse metabolically. And that the reason that insulin is so important is that if they are hyperinsulinemic, then we know that they are at higher risk for laminitis. And to me, laminitis is the most important symptom that we are trying to prevent. Uh, And in the ideal world, we are preventing it, not treating it. Um, because it can be impossible to to catch up once you have a horse have that initial metabolic right. crisis and endocrinopathic yeah. laminitis. And something Michelle said earlier that I think is important to point out, you mentioned about taking your horse to the vet. Mm-hmm. For these tests, you may yeah. not, my understanding is you may not want to take your horse to yes. the vet. Yep, exactly. And that's always a tough thing too, because I, you know, I, I see a lot of sick horses in the hospital that I may want to treat but then, or I may want to test. And then there's always this question of, well, is the stress of shipping, being hospitalized, the pain from laminitis, if they are having a laminitis flare, how is that going to affect my testing? Um, I tend to still test them, but I definitely keep that in mind when interpreting my results. And that may be another example of a horse where I might start them on treatment because I'm trying to prevent that laminitis from developing or getting worse and then I might pull them off later so that we can get a more definitive diagnosis yeah. but it, it sometimes it is worthwhile just treating them um to try to especially if they're hyperinsulinemic uh, we now also getting off topic a little bit but you know we now do have the spellified insulin test which 
have their weaknesses for sure, but it can be, it's nice. I really like being able to get a quick uh, leaf ballpark um, idea of what the person's insulin level is. Again, particularly for me with the stick horses in the hospital, so I can manage them appropriately. And just a quick, I mean, this is a whole topic in itself, and we, I don't want to go off on this tangent, but just to quickly touch on it, like if you're having your vet out to do the testing and they're going to, they're just going to do an ACTH or an ACTH stim and a basic static insulin, do they need to be fasted? <laughs> yeah, that's the great question. Um, so the current recommendation is that they should not, they can have play that is ideally you know what sugar content is because everybody knows what their horse's hay sugar content is, but right? <laughs> they have hay of this ideally a low starch hay, um, and then they have not had grass or grain for three hours. Uh, so that's the that's the full part. We've we've gotten away from doing as much fasted insulin testing as well um, because we really want to know what that horse is natural condition is. You know, our horses are really never fasted. They shouldn't be, then they'll get ulcers. <laughs> Which is a whole nother episode. <laughs> we'll have to back for that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh the the recommendation is more and more to get a sample when they have not recently had a high start to meal, aka greener grass, but they uh have but they they can um, Low starch hay is generally considered acceptable. It does also, though, it depends a little bit again on if you're talking about monitoring or getting an initial diagnosis for an initial diagnosis for equine metabolic syndrome, hyperinsulinemia. I actually prefer to do an oral sugar test um, for which they do need to be fasted. <laughs> so, right. It gets pretty complicated. It does. It does. Yeah. So, okay, so you've got the test and it's come back and your values are high. You're looking at a PPID diagnosis, like now what? Yeah, so really the mainstay of treatment is Percent, which is the FDA approved formulation of Herbalide, uh, which is a medication that mimics the effects of dopamine in the body. And essentially the end result is decreased levels of ACTH and cortisol in the body. Uh, it is very effective. It is not without some side effects in some horses, uh, but it is, it is quite effective in most horses for at, for at least a period of time. <laughs> So my horse is on pergolide and um, or percent. He yes. gets percent the pink pill, and he you know he get, gets a little bit more now than he used to, um, but he hates it, and it's saving his life. And that's what I tell him: this is saving your life. <laughs> and then I then I make my husband give it to him because my husband gets to be the bad guy. Um, it's we have a whole routine, but when he first went on it he really struggled with appetite and is that pretty typical it's very very common yes uh, i nowadays i often start them out on half of what i want their target dose to be uh, for the first week and then i'll have the owner increase them so many full-size horses get one pill a day which is one milligram um, I, so I may have them start with half a pill once a day, and then if they have no signs, increase them there. Some horses are very, very sensitive and will go off feed uh, for concerning periods of time. And so we'll, you know, we'll stop, um, get them back on feed, which usually within a day or two, they hear appetite uh, the resume. And so then I'll start at a very low dose. And sometimes we have to go really, really low becomes a logistical issue because it's hard to split the pills and they don't store great once you pop the blister pack. But um, sometimes that's necessary just to kind of in introduce the medication to their to their system and allow them to adapt to it. But most of them do. I do have some horses that I will keep consistently keep on um, twice a day uh, dosing intervals and because they tolerate that better as opposed to going so half a milligram or it depends what their total dose is but um, 
you know, up to half to two twice a day is the, is the, um, the range in, the, in a full size board. Yeah. So with mine, I found like I had to give him just some space to eat. I'm very like, I like my horses to be together and social. And But he really just needed like his quiet alone time with his his hay to eat it. Um, but Claire at the time uh, gave me some recommendations on helping him eat. Um, do you have, Claire, any recommendations that, that you want to share on getting them to eat without giving them the delicious things that some of them probably shouldn't be eating anyway? Well, I've th- that's where having that insulin result is so helpful, right? Because if they're not hyperinsulinemic, then you can be a little bit more, you know, I'm not feeling exactly. so stressed. I can have a little bit more, you know, yummy stuff, a little bit of starch, a little bit more NSC in the diet than I would if they're also hyperinsulinemic. So that can be really helpful for these picky eaters. Some of them are really hard. I mean, some of them literally, it's like, it feels like every week owners are saying, well, last week he ate this, but now I won't eat it anymore. And and it's like, they have like three open bags of stuff and it's just a, what will it eat this week kind of thing. It gets really tricky. So I don't know that there's really any, it's just a lot of experimentation. It takes a bit of dedication. And then you also run into the horses that won't take the medication anymore. They've gotten really smart and they won't eat the pills. And I, my sense is they're, they don't taste great. And so if they get, you know, used to, if they crunch one accidentally and then they taste it, they kind of start. So you sometimes have to kind of go, you know, one for you, two for you, third one with the pill, four for you, you know, kind of like. They, they learn to count when you do that. So <laughs> <laughs> I have a friend who was a vet tech and she buys empty gel- gelatin pill capsules. And she actually puts her Prescent tab inside a gelatin gel capsule so it doesn't flavor. She puts in a little bit of carrot or something and it doesn't flavor the carrot as she's putting it in there, which is really clever. And that's been a really big deal for her pony. Um, now can't taste it in the carrot, so we'll take it. So yeah, there are some, you know, Fig Newtons make great pill pockets, pitted prunes. You know, one pitted prune probably isn't going to be the end of the world. Yeah. And, you know. Any tricks up your sleeve, Flora? Yeah, I mean, similar, uh, some of the low sugar, soft horse treats, you can shove it in there. We have clients that will dig a little spot in a slice of apple. Um, again, if their insulin isn't too high. <laughs> so, yeah, it can be really, really tricky. Uh, sometimes I'll use some unsweetened applesauce as well, uh, just so the horse feels like they're getting a little something tasty yeah. with their pills. Yeah. Can't be tough. One thing, you know, one just it just reminded me, one caveat is to be really careful about not opening the packets in the morning and leaving them out all day to be fed at night or putting them in with the grain then because they are they will oxidize in the air and be less effective. So while it's more convenient, it's best to leave it in its little foil packet. Um, until as close to administration as possible. Good to know, because it's expensive stuff. You don't want, yeah, to, exactly. want it to work. Want to get your bang for the buck. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. What about like, what about ongoing monitoring? Because I know I had a friend that had a horse that had had PPID diagnosis and been on percent for three or four years, and she didn't do any follow up work. And it was actually very sad because end of September rolled around one year and the horse suddenly had a very acute laminitis belt. And when they drew blood on it, its values were off the charts. And it was sort of like, but I have it on the medication. Like this wasn't supposed to happen. Yeah. And my heart just sank for her. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I recommend. So I think that monitoring their clinical signs is really important. And so... If the owner sees a backsliding and a recurrence of clinical signs, that's a big red flag that they may not be as well regulated as they once were. And they do, they do tend to need more medication over time. So I recommend testing an ACTH uh, at least once a year. And if I'm going to do it once a year, then my preference again is to do it in the fall uh, because we know that baseline is a bit more sensitive. So in our area, we routinely recommend uh, fall shots. Um, boosters are usually, you usually need a booster for something in the fall. Um, and so that's typically a good time to have that done as well, to combine appointments, just to keep an eye on on the dose and if they need to be bumped up a bit. But I also think it's important to keep in mind that we really don't want to 
treat the numbers. Uh, there are some horses, you know, depending on what their level is when you start treating treatment, they might not ever get back to completely normal, less than 35. Uh, but if their clinical signs are controlled and we've seen a significant decrease, uh, I like to see at least like 75% decrease in their original number as a response to treatment, then I'm happy with that. I'm not going to keep increasing the dose until that number is normal because some horses will start to have you know, significant side effects if they're on a dose that they don't need to be on and they'll go off their feed. And also it's really expensive. You don't want to get more of it than you, than you need to be. So right. um, I think some owners get really hung up on the numbers and it's really, really important to look at the horse too. Besides the, uh, the getting the horse to the medication, which is the, the treatment, what management strategies do you recommend to your clients for their horses? Yeah, so I think anything we can do to help their general health and immune system stay as strong as possible is really key. So it's all the just routine general um, health recommendations, but vaccinations, uh, their immunity starts to wane as they're older, even if they don't have PPID. So there, there's a misconception out there with some owners that they don't need to be vaccinated anymore when they're older. That's it's absolutely the opposite. Um, and even more so if they have PPID because they will be less capable of fighting off infections of all kinds. For the same reasons, you know, who's care, like they are going to be more prone to foot abscesses. Uh, and then diet is, is huge and it's, it's not the same thing for every horse. And again, a lot of that depends on their insulin status in conjunction that with that. Um, but really evaluating their body condition closely. Uh, and it's something that we like to include in our annual exams as well. It's just, you know, and I love to take pictures of horses because I don't always remember them. And so if we can put a picture in the record to keep track of what they what they looked like, what their body condition was, and to get a sense of those uh, fat deposits, the regional adiposity and how that changes over time, it's great part of the record to have. When it comes to exercise, I'm pretty concerned because I'm like, I don't want to make him work. But then I'm like, oh, but I think maybe exercise might be good for him. But then I'm like, ah, oh, he shouldn't have to carry me around. Like, I really, I go back and forth and I love riding him. He's so much fun. Um, but, I and he likes the attention. Pro exercise. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah, I do. And, it, it, and so, you know, we see a lot of uh, muscle wasting in horses with TPID. So anything we can do to help maintain that muscle mass. And then even more so if they are hyperinsulinemics because exercise can help improve their insulin regulation. Uh, and, you know, I try to encourage people to like even small amounts of exercise regularly can be really, really helpful. Uh, obviously in the horse is not painful because it has laminitis, but even if they've had, you know, if they've had laminitis and they've been treated successfully and they're stable, they should be getting as much exercise as they will, as they will tolerate, not they make them run around or something, but um, <laughs> yeah. you know, there's no reason to restrict them if they're, if they're comfortable. And even things like turning them out in a pasture with hills, if that's something you have access to, um, can be really helpful too. Right. And I think I, I would just add from the nutrition standpoint that while, you know, many of these horses may have EMS and have fat deposits, some of them are also quite lean, you know, yeah. pointed out the muscle, you know, wasting component. They really struggle to maintain lean muscle mass. So, um, you know, having a source of quality protein in the diet can be really important for these horses. Absolutely. And if you don't use it, you lose it, right? And oftentimes yeah. they're also seniors and motion is lotion. We hear that too, right? So it's just kind of, you know, it's it's the movement is, is so beneficial. And um, there's a lot more I can do with nutrition if, if they're getting exercised. We've touched on laminitis quite a few times, but I did want to ask specifically because I I trim my own horses um, and I found that I just learn a lot about my horses and their health from their feet. Um, every time I'm under them. Is there anything in particular uh, that I should be looking for when I'm working on his feet that might give me clues that something's not right? You mentioned you mentioned abscesses. You know, laminitis is the thing that makes me, you know, lose sleep at night. Mine isn't insulin resistant. We don't have any insulin issues. Fortunately, we like won that. <laughs> 
part of this this game, but um, but I do still worry. Yeah, I mean, I think any notable change in their feet can be important. So whether it's that their uh, feet become softer than they used to be, or or significantly more brittle, certainly when they start to develop um, hoof rings, uh, that can be of concern. Um, if they even if they just start having you know, weight line disease all the time and they didn't before any 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 significant change and that's where you know, you're at an advantage because you've known your horse so long yeah. and that's really helpful it's it's hard when people acquire these middle-aged horses you know uh, later in life and it's hard to know what their their baseline is for a lot of these things we've talked about yeah and i think there's a misconception i mean i think people don't link I had a client once who was like, oh, my like 22 year old horse always gets abscesses in September. And I'm like, danger, Will Robinson, danger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you need to talk to your vet. Like, you know, it's like that could yeah. be subclinical laminitis where you're getting, you know, death in those lamellae and they're, you know, creating pus pockets or whatever right. that are then coming out as abscesses. Like it's exactly. And, you know, those horses, we know subclinical laminitis is really common with the horses with EMS and we can see a lot of those chronic changes on radiographs of their feet, even in horses that clinically never were never really particularly sore. Um, so, you know, I'm a, particularly in the the breeds that are very prone to metabolic syndrome. Uh, I'm a huge proponent of just getting baseline foot rads at some point because absolutely it's scary sometimes what we <laughs> for what we don't know is hiding. Yeah, and I think just understanding all these symptoms. I mean, I think there was a research paper done. It was in the UK where they where the owners just weren't aware of some of the, you know, subclinical symptoms yeah. that they just weren't. They didn't even know that their horses had EMS or PPID. They just were missing these symptoms, and it's it's so tragic. I mean, I normally get one or two a year where you know you suddenly it's an acute laminitis in September October in a horse that's in its early twenties, and actually it's been having PPID issues for a little while, but they've just been these little rumbling things that nobody picked up on. And it is just heartbreaking. Yeah. Yeah. And that's with mine. I'm glad that I saw the things. It was, it was a combination of the, the urination, the attitude, and then uh, he started getting a little thrushy in his feet. I'm like, no, this isn't white. Like he's not, that's not normal for him. Yeah. So um, as, as we close out the conversation about PPID, and there's so much more we could talk about, but, but we do have limited time. I wanted to ask, at what point should an owner seek out the support of an ACVIM in their management of of the PPID horse? You know, there's there's a lot of pieces here to manage between yeah. nutrition and the disease and their feet, because, I mean, there's room for a, p- a podiatrist, I think, on the yeah. team for these horses, too. But how do you find one? Like, how do you find an ACVIM? <laughs> like, you know. There's not there's not very many. We only have one 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 here in Oregon close so yeah it's a really good question that i and i i appreciate you asking uh, because you know there's certainly i think a not as much understanding from the general horse owning population of who we are and what we do or that we exist at all <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know i think you know, to me the ideal situation is i'm really working as a team with the regular veterinarian that is being the horse uh on a, on a regular basis and knows that horse well and it's knows how it's changed over time um and with the owner uh a a team member as well of course and so you know i think i actually i do a lot of consulting on metabolic uh patents and blood work for veterinarians so it's certainly something you can you know ask your veterinarian if they have a relationship with an internal medicine specialist uh and they can reach out but I will say that my ability to advise well on horses is always limited if I'm only doing the blood work. Um, because as I said before, you know, it's it's uh, it's not just about treating the numbers on the piece of paper. Um, and so uh, there is there can be benefit to having an internist uh, if there is one in your area to your horse in person. And then I think certainly, you know, with, with endocrine disease, as with any other disease, if your horse with medical issues are, you know, getting really complicated um, and or they're not re- improving despite your veterinarian best efforts, then that's where a specialist may be helpful. Um, and I always prefer 
like I said, working in conjunction with that regular veterinarian uh, that, that knows the horse. But most internists are very happy to work directly with owners as well if they uh, feel that they want a more in-depth analysis of the of the situation. I think um, as a horse owner, like I know that my horse, it's not, he's always going to have it. But it does seem like we have advancements every year. Like there, there are researchers who are looking at this and finding better ways for us to take care of the horses um, every every year. So there, there's still hope. So it's not. It's a little. It's a sad. It's sad when you get the diagnosis, but it is manageable. You raise a really good point, Michelle, that I think is important to stress because we've talked about a lot of really scary things. Yeah, <laughs> and you know, I will say I work with some, you know really athletic performance horses that have PPID and are leading very competitive, happy, active lives Absolutely. because they're well managed. And, yeah. you know, and I have horses that are in their very late 20s, you know, 28, 30 years old with PPID. So it can be managed. And, you know, the competitive bodies now, at least on the, you know, sort of these English side of things, you can you can get affidavits now that allow you to compete without having to withdraw your medication and things. So things are really changing and you still can, you know, if the horse is sound and happy and working, it can still be a competitive athlete if that's what it's lifestyle is you know so it's not all doom and gloom yeah absolutely i mean there are lots of lots of horses with dpid out there that are relatively easy to manage on the appropriate medications and and can do really well and never have to come see me <laughs> right <laughs> so they're not the ones i tend to see right they do, right? They do exist <laughs> yeah <laughs> So and and mine, I'm thankful for the medication and and uh, that he had, it definitely returned him back to uh, opening gates. So that's when I knew he was feeling better. Oh, is when the gates all yeah. were open. Yeah, oh God! Future advancements. I think that our ongoing knowledge of the GI microbiome and how that plays into en- endocrine regulation is is an area where we're going to see a lot of improvements in the next few years. So it's a uh, it's still it's still a bit of a mystery, but it's uh, we know it's important. It's yeah, how to um, appropriately. <laughs> yeah, yeah, lots of exciting research. And so when when it when we know more about it, we'll ask you more about it. So yeah. <laughs> so Have to come back. Yeah, thank you. Um, unfortunately, that is all the time we have. Uh, when we've packed a lot in about. PPID in an hour. Uh, thank you, Laura, for joining us. We really appreciate your time. We know how busy you are. If you're listening and you want to be part of our conversations, please send your suggestions for future topics and equine nutrition questions to info at scoop and scale.com and is spelled out. And you can find Claire at clarityequine.com. And please make sure to subscribe wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts and share with your friends and give us shout outs on social media. We also have started a newsletter. You can sign up at scoopandscale.com to get notified every time we launch a new episode. For the Scoop and Scale podcast, I'm Michelle Anderson. And I'm Dr. Claire Tunis. Thanks for riding along with us. <laughs> <laughs>